So thank you so much for coming. I'm super happy you guys are here. Um, I have been using continuous glucose monitors with my patients now for a good probably two years in the background, but a whole lot more in the last six months. And so I wanted to give you guys kind of a, a quick and dirty overview of what is it and how do these things kind of work. Um, one uh, caveat I have to share with you today is I'm home with my sick little Dylan, my four-year-old Dylan. He's in the other room watching Paw Patrol, and I'm hoping Paw Patrol is entertaining enough. <laughs> so if he comes in, I might get interrupted, and I'm sorry, but you all will get to see his cute little face, and you know that real moms are doing real businesses, and this is he had to stay home today, so that's happening, but that's okay. Um, you should be able to see the chat. And if you guys have questions, please pop in. I'm totally open to being interrupted and having questions in the middle of the presentation. I encourage questions. So if you have a question, just ask it when you have the question, because it's very likely someone else has the same question. So I'm going to go ahead and get my slides here. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Shannon. Alrighty. So what is continuous glucose monitoring? Continuous glucose monitoring is when we're using a device to automatically estimate your blood glucose level, which is also called blood sugar throughout the day and night. And um, I actually brought an example of what one looks like. And after we go through the presentation, I'm going to show you guys what it looks like. It's a tiny little round sticker that goes on the back of your arm with a very, very small needle. And I'll show you what it looks like. I'm actually going to put one on today. So you guys are going to get to see how it goes on. So continuous glucose monitoring is basically where you're measuring your blood glucose. Now, the reason that this is estimating your blood glucose is because the needle goes on the back of your arm and it probably goes in about a third of an inch. And I know that seems like a long way, but the needle is about, it's about as flimsy as an acupuncture needle. You, you literally don't feel it going in at all. And then once it's stuck on the back of your arm, you don't even feel it. You feel the sticker and you feel the fact that there's this kind of sticker thing on the back of your arm, but it's a surprisingly like, Un, you, you really forget about it. You literally will, will forget about it. It goes on the back of your arm for two weeks. You do start to notice it more and more the longer it's been on because the sticker on the back gets a little bit, um, it starts to fray around the edge and then it pulls on your arm hair. That's really the as much of an irritation as it is. Now, the reason I say that this is an estimation of your blood sugar is because the needle isn't going into your blood. It's not going into a vessel. So when we draw your blood and you come in for labs and I poke you with the needle and I get into your vein, that is measuring blood glucose. This is measuring extracellular fluid sugar, which is essentially estimating what your sugar is inside of the blood vessel. So it's not exactly the same. And sometimes you will actually have, um, there will be discrepancies in your numbers and you kind of have to remember, okay, well, there's a little bit of a delay. Um, generally, the idea is there's about a 10 minute delay. So whatever your extracellular fluid is, your blood sugar is about 10 minutes. Your, your blood sugar is the now. It'll take about 10 minutes for that now blood sugar to show up in your extracellular fluid, but that's still 10 minutes versus when you go to the doctor and have your labs drawn, you've got to wait two weeks or a week or however long it is that you're waiting for your lab results for you to get those results. So the cool thing about this is this is instantaneous blood sugar numbers, which means you get to track it. How is blood sugar measured? So this is glucose measured in milligrams per deciliter, and that's just the unit. That's the unit. And if any of you have any old lab reports that I've given you, you can see that's the unit. And then this measures the concentration of how much blood is floating around in, an, in a specific amount of fluid per deciliter of blood. That's basically what blood glucose is measuring. Now, here's kind of a fun fact. The average person has about one teaspoon of sugar in their blood at any given time. If your sugar levels go too far above that, then your pancreas is going to detect that your sugar has gotten too high and pancreas releases insulin. 
I like to think of insulin as the key that unlocks the door. And once the door is open, sugar is going to go outside of the house, inside of the house. And then once it goes inside of the house, it's going to get burned up in the mitochondria. And then sugar gets converted into ATP, which gives us energy. So at any point in time, we should have sugar floating around in our blood. This is a very, very Goldilocks situation. We don't want there to be too much sugar and we don't want there to be not enough. And the most important organ that this very delicate balance is based on is your brain. If your blood sugar gets too high, your brain is going to start to experience hyperglycemic symptoms. And you can have, you can actually have a, you can go into a coma. You can actually die if your blood sugar gets too high. The blood sugar, the brain just can't handle that much sugar. Now, what happens is if your sugar gets too high, your body is going to make a bunch of insulin, open all the doors, blood sugar is going to go inside all of the cells. And then what happens is the sugar in your blood promptly goes down, goes inside of the cells, but now there's no sugar left in your blood. And now you're left hypoglycemic. So there's this very delicate balance between the food you eat, the sugar goes into your stomach. You kind of want to follow, you know, let's trace the life, the lifespan of a sugar molecule, right? You swallow the sugar molecule. It goes down into your stomach. Now we actually absorb sugar under our tongue. So if you literally just suck on a piece of sugar or a candy or whatever, you can even suck on white bread and white bread is going to very quickly get broken down into sugar. You even, you know, you know it when you suck on white bread, it falls apart so quickly in your mouth and white bread, even it makes you happy. You have like a, there's like a, a little bit of a high that happens. And it's because you're very quickly converting that piece of bread into blood sugar. So there's this delicate balance and roller coaster between the food you eat, the sugar that goes in, it goes down into your stomach it's going to go into your small intestine and immediately in your small intestine, it's highly vascularized. Think of your intestines as having all these blood vessels wrapped around your blood vessels. I'm sorry, your intestines is like the tube and all of the blood vessels are wrapped around the intestines. And the microvilli are the little, the little fimbriae that your food lands in and the sugar is going to get absorbed across the microvilli. It goes down into the cell. And then inside the cell, there's the vessels. The vessels are everywhere down here. And the sugar very quickly goes from the inside of the tube of your intestines into your blood. And then once it's in your blood, blood can transfer through your whole body very quickly. I don't remember this statistic, but a drop of blood will circulate your entire body in about, I think it's about three minutes. So very quickly, whatever you eat is immediately everywhere in your bloodstream, which means it's immediately in your brain. This is why sugar is so addicting and happy, happy. It makes you happy. You feel it very, very quickly. And same thing if your blood sugar drops too low, you can go into a coma and you're going to start to have symptoms. I'm sure you've all experienced hypoglycemic symptoms where you get a little irritable, you get a little bit shaky. So there's a Fun fact, what are normal blood sugar levels for people without diabetes? So the range for blood sugar is generally between 70 and 100. Now that's what it says on the lab order form. We're gonna go through some more goal reference ranges there. Um, there's different times of day to measure your blood sugar. There's fasting and fasting is, the goal is between 70 and 100. Now I say this later, but I'm gonna say it now too. My optimal for a fasting blood sugar is I want it really less than 90. So I want it between 70 and 90. And then two hours after eating, what will happen is immediately after eating your food, your sugar is gonna go up and then it's gonna come back down. And by two hours after eating, it should be less than 140. So those are kind of the numbers to, to look at is fasting or a pre-meal, you want your sugar in the lower end. It should be low because you haven't recently eaten sugar. So you want it in the 70, 80, 90 range. Then you're going to have a meal and it's going to go up. It might even go up to 200. And it's not, you know, each of the curve, each of the pieces of the curve is going to tell you a different thing. How quickly the curve goes up 
to a 180, if it goes up there really quickly, then that's what we call a high glycemic food, meaning you broke it down into sugar very, very quickly. A low glycemic food is going to take longer for your blood sugar to get up to a 180. And then two hours after, it should have already peaked and it should be coming back down. And your insulin should be efficiently being produced and secreted from your pancreas and your insulin receptors. Oh, I love that little function. That is so funny. Your, your insulin should be secreted from your pancreas. And then the insulin should also be working properly on the keyhole on all of the cell receptors and letting sugar in. So not only are you, is this information going to tell you how quickly is your sugar going up, but it's also telling you how good is your sugar now coming down after the food. And all of that has to depend on what you ate. And we're going to go through this in more detail. So these numbers here, a fasting you want in the 70 to 90. Conventionally, they say normal is all the way up to a 100. And then it's normal for a two hour post, we call it post perandial. And you'll abbreviate it as a PP or a post meal. So a two hour post meal, your blood sugar should be back down to a 140 or less. So those are some helpful numbers to know. No. Here are again, so the American Diabetes Association, they describe a normal as anything less than 100. The World Health Organization describes normal is anywhere from 70 to 100. These ranges to me are huge. And I always try to educate my patients to have kind of a more optimal reference range. So the naturopathic more optimal reference range is we want this between 70 and 90. And that's kind of every time we get labs back, I try to show people that. However, just looking at your morning fasting numbers is also not the entire picture. You kind of want to also remember that um, you've got your fasting number, you've got your two hour post number, and then that's going to be different after every single meal. Every single meal, you're going to have a pre-meal and a post-meal. And then we, I don't have a slide on hemoglobin A1C, but hemoglobin A1C is also another important number because this is going to give you what your average blood sugar is for the prior three months. And then another sugar marker is insulin, measuring insulin. We want a fasting to be nice and low. If a fasting is high, then that means that there's residual insulin floating around from the prior meal where the insulin had to work really, really hard to try to get the sugar to go inside of the cell. So this is fasting blood sugar, and we talked about those other labs. And again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat. So here's a picture of a continuous glucose monitor tracking. So they have this line here at 70, basically saying anything lower than that is a little too low, but it's not uncommon for someone to drop below 70. So in this picture, the person ate lunch right here, and then post lunch, it went back up and then it went back down. And it's not uncommon for you to have these additional up and downs because whatever food they ate is going to potentially slowly digest and then get broken down into the sugar. This here is two hours post. So this person, here was their pre-meal. And you can see here that they're approximately at 80. And then after lunch, they jumped up all the way to a 100. So a two hour post meal, a normal person should be somewhere in the 70 to 100. I'm, so, I'm sorry, pre-meal, pre-meal, they should be in the 70 to 100. Two hours post meal, they should be less than 140. So there's an example of a non-diabetic person. And here's just another picture. So we've got a normal maximum. It's normal to be here pre-meal, and then after a meal, it's normal to go all the way up, in this case, to a 140. Now, this is an example where they went all the way up to a 140, but they also could have even gone higher. So this could have gone all the way up, and then two hours after the meal, their insulin has secreted enough and let it go down. So that's another example. Now, this is um, what are normal blood sugar levels for somebody with diabetes. So now with diabetes, the CDC recommends that their fasting blood sugar is between 80 and 130. 
So once they go over 130, technically, once they go over 124, they're now diabetic. Now, remember, we're talking fasting here. So this is fasting in the morning. We want them less than 124. And again, my ideal is less than 90. So for a diabetic, it's not uncommon for them to have an elevated fasting blood sugar. Um, this would be a diabetic person, right? Pre, they're down at 100. And then two hours post-meal, they're up at a 180. Remember, they're supposed to be less than 140. So using a continuous glucose monitor, it offers several benefits. Um, and I'm using this actually primarily in people that are just wanting to become more aware of their diet. I'm also using this primarily as a weight loss strategy because you get instantaneous feedback about how your meal got broken down into sugar. The other reason I'm using this is I'm, I have a number of patients now using semaglutide as a weight loss peptide. And when they're on semaglutide, one, and we could have a whole, a whole webinar on semaglutide, but when they're on semaglutide, their appetite is significantly lower and it's fairly easy for them to eat well. When they get off semaglutide, their appetite's going to come back and it's going to be important for them to maintain really healthy diet habits and make sure that their macronutrients are good. And what I mean by that is plenty of protein, plenty of fiber around the sugar that they're eating so that they're not getting too high of blood sugar spikes or too long, too high of a two hour postprandial. So even though we think of continuous glucose monitors as being used for diabetics, I'm using it for pre-diabetics, pre-pre-diabetics and people just trying to lose weight. So here are some advantages. So you get real time monitoring. Um, the monitor goes on the back of your arm and then you use your phone and you actually can track what your blood sugar looks like. So it helps you to keep an eye on your blood sugar all day long. To me, this is one of the biggest, this, this is the reason is that you get real time glucose monitoring. You also get personalized dietary adjustments. When, when you see what your sugars are doing, then you're going to be able to adjust your meals. Now, there's a number of different ways of getting a glucose monitor, and I have a chart at the end that will show you some of the different ways. Um, I'll just mention one of them now. One of the ways to do it is actually as a prescription where you just send the prescription to Walgreens or CVS and you can get one. If your insurance doesn't cover it, they're about $80 to $100 for two sensors. A sensor goes on the back of your arm for two weeks. Now, the problem with doing it that way, which I have done many times, is that that device only tracks your blood sugar, which is very interesting, but it's not as helpful if you're not tracking your meals. You really need an app that is tracking both your meals and your blood sugar. Now, for my super tech savvy people, you could have an Excel spreadsheet and you're tracking your meals and you're tracking your blood sugar and you're kind of tracking it all together there where you're seeing it, or you're gonna pay for an app. And that's really where the expense comes in is you're paying for the app. So you this is obviously an advantage is that you've got a dietary, it teaches you how to make dietary modifications. So here's a picture of one of the sensors. You can see it's a little bit bigger than a quarter. And then this is a monitor that you can use. And again, you're just monitoring blood sugar. It tells you what your sugar is, but there's no way to track meals in between these sugar measurements, if that makes sense. When you're tracking your blood sugar and you're seeing what's happening and you're getting instantaneous feedback, it's going to, you, then you, then you change your subsequent meals. It tells you, did I get enough protein? Did I get enough fat. Now, let me clarify. The monitor doesn't tell you eat more protein at your next meal. It doesn't do that. You have to learn how to read the curve. And if the curve spikes too quickly, you know, it was too high of a glycemic meal, or, you know, there wasn't enough fiber or there wasn't enough protein. So the next time you eat that meal, you need to make sure that you get in the fiber and you get in the protein first and lessen the amount of carbs that you had so that you don't get the spike and it takes a little longer for your sugar to go up, which means it's going to come down more quickly. So here, it's not so much that the device tells you what to do. You have to interpret it, which is why you kind of need help interpreting it. But all of the patients that I've trained to do this, 
I train them and then they know how to do it. They can read their own numbers and they go, oh, look, that meal really spiked my blood sugar. I had a really interesting story. A patient of mine was getting these spikes and she ended up having a bunch of ice cream and she was expecting that her blood sugar was going to spike really, really high and then crash. Now, ice cream, it was full fat, full dairy ice cream. She actually barely had an increase. And it's because there was way more fat in the ice cream than there was sugar. So the fat slowed down the absorption of the sugar. Now, I'm not saying ice cream is going to be your solution to all of your meals. But the point is, is that it's the macronutrients. We've got protein, fiber, carbohydrates, and sorry, carbs, protein, fat, and fiber. Those are your four macronutrients. And it's really important that they're all balanced in your meal. So using a continuous glucose monitor is going to help you with behavior changes, accountability. All of my patients that have used one, they become much more motivated to track their sugars. Another thing, too, is sometimes we'll be eating things and we don't even realize how much sugar there is in what we eat. So really quick conversation about our macronutrients. Um, if we were interactive, I would be asking you guys questions, but there's a short delay in the webinar chat versus when I'm talking. So I'm just going to kind of go through these examples. So let's say you have a smoothie and the smoothie has bananas and blueberries and pineapple. Now we know bananas and blueberry and pineapple is fruit. And if you were to eat those, if you were to juice them, meaning put them in a juicer, separate out the fiber and you're left with just the juice. That is pure fruit juice with no fiber. If you were to drink that, your sugar would spike and then crash because there's nothing to slow down the absorption of the sugar. Whereas if you were to juice it, I'm sorry, not juice it, blend it, put it in a blender where it's now a blender. And now you've just blended the fiber. You haven't removed the fiber. You've blended the fiber and you drink it. You'll still get a spike, but you'll notice the spike is not going to be as steep and they won't crash as quickly. There will be a, a longer downward line. Um, another kind of concept to wrap your brain around is that all vegetables are carbs. So the difference between a slice of white bread and a, a, a stalk of broccoli, they're both carbs which means broccoli is going to get broken down into sugar. The difference between a slice of white bread and a piece of broccoli is the fiber. The amount of fiber, if you were to put some white bread into your mouth, you could literally, you wouldn't even need to chew. You just suck on it and your tongue is going to break that white bread down into sugar very quickly. Whereas if you take some broccoli and you stick it in your mouth, you're going to be sitting there gnawing on it for a really long time. And even then, it's probably not going to get broken down very well. You're going to have to chew it really, really well, swallow it, and then the digestive enzymes and the hydrochloric acid in your stomach are going to break it down and eventually turn that into sugar. That's the difference in your glycemic index. And if you look up glycemic index of foods, you can get a list of high glycemic foods versus low glycemic foods. But I've had a lot of people where they're doing lots of fruit and they think that it's a healthy smoothie, but the smoothie is still, it's a sugar bomb. So what I'll do is say, let's figure out a way to add fat to that smoothie. So throw in a half of an avocado or throw in some nut butter or a handful of nuts. So you want to throw in a healthy fat or you want to throw in some other sort of a fiber or you want to throw in that protein. Um, so another really benefit here is you don't have to do finger pricks. So when I have treated diabetics or pre-diabetics and we need to start measuring their blood sugar, poking your finger is painful. It's a pain in the butt. You've got to get the device. It's a whole pain in the butt. Whereas having something like this, there's no finger pricks at all. You're getting real time information, which we've talked about. And then I mentioned this, but I'll just mention this again. If you get taught how to use it, you can really learn a lot on how to manage and evaluate your own meals. But in the beginning, it's really important to have someone kind of hold your hand and teach you on interpreting the data. Now, this is a chart that I made. Freestyle is the name of one of the companies that makes the device. So Freestyle is the company, and then the device is called Libre3. 
if you were to just send a prescription to the pharmacy for this, it's around 80 to 100 bucks or so, maybe even 150 for a month's supply of sensors. The problem with this is you're using the Freestyle app that does not track your food. There's a number of companies now. Thea is one. And these prices... It's possible they've changed. The market has changed a lot already in the last two months since I've made this. But you can see it's expensive. And what you're paying Recording for. Recording stopped. What you're paying for is you're paying for the use of their app. Now, the app that I used that I was hoping to show you if we have time and people want to see it was NutriSense. If you go to NutriSense, I have a discount code for it's Leela. Dr. Leela 25, if you plug that discount code in, you do get a percentage off. They don't even advertise the one month. They only advertise the three, six, and 12 months. Um, I can send out the links to these if you're really interested in the one month. A one month to me, to me, one month is not enough time to really learn how to use your numbers. I would commit to a three month, which means you're paying $2.99 a month. Now, the advantage to NutriSense that I was really intrigued by is that it comes with a nutritionist in the app. You literally are texting and they can see your data. So when I tested this out and I would, I asked her, I was like, what's wrong with that meal? That meal seemed fine to me. There was plenty of protein. There was plenty of fat, but we kind of looked at it and we went back and I looked at the, um, the carb to protein ratio and it was a little bit on the low end and I was getting these spikes. Um, Levels is another company, and I have a link specifically if you guys want to use theirs too. Now, this is, this is, um, it's $99 a year for the app access, but that doesn't include the sensors. It's $199 a month if you are, and that will get you two sensors. Um, and I'm trying to remember why this, oh, 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 it's because so when you add these two numbers together, that's what it is. It's $400 to set up with them, and and that's about $216 per month. So this one is, I think, cheaper. So you have to just make sure that when you're evaluating these companies, you're looking at, am I getting the sensors? And again, remember, you're going to need two sensors per month. This is another company that is um, out there now is Cygnos. And you have to you have to go through and make sure that you're not only getting the plan, but you're also getting the sensors. I think three months is sufficient. I don't think you need to do this for longer than that. Here's another one. Here's the Thea. So I'll let you guys play with that. I am going. See if I can turn my slides off. There we go. And then I wanted to show you guys, and again, if you have questions, please pop them in. I'm assuming you guys can still hear and see me. So inside the box is this very large piece of plastic that unfortunately mostly gets wasted. Here's your instruction manual that you're never going to use. And what I have here is some alcohol wipes. So what you're going to do is alcohol the back of your arm. I'm gonna be very picky and do three of them. Then you're gonna take this thing and you open it up. I just broke the seal. And this whole thing here was just holding the needle in there. And inside there is the sticky sticker. And then there you can see the sharp needle. And it's long, but it's pretty flimsy. It's flimsy like an acupuncture needle. And all I'm gonna do, this thing is spring loaded. All you do is you put it on the back of your arm. You envision kind of where you want it to be. And I, you just push really hard like that. And there you go. I felt it, but that was like a three out of 10 pain. And it was, it was over like that. You don't feel it at all. And you can see it's flat. It's pretty flat. I also recommend doing multiple alcohol pads because um, if you have lotion on your skin, it will not stick. 
and you're out a sensor, which is really annoying. So alcohol it really, really well. Do we need a script for all of these companies? No, you don't. You do not need a script. The only one you need a script for would be if I were going to send a script to Walgreens or CVS for you. And then you, you get this. That was how I got this. I prescribed this for myself at Walgreens and I paid, my insurance didn't cover it because I have a high deductible. And I think I paid about 80 bucks and I got two sensors. So 80 bucks for me is going to cover two sensors. Which brand did you put on? Just now I put on the Freestyle Libre. Now I'm experimenting. Part of my experimentation is um, I'm curious if I can connect this one to my old NutriSense app. I'm no longer paying for NutriSense anymore because I just did the one month. But I'm curious if I can set it up. So when you do connect it, you then have to go into the settings and you have to sync them. You have to sync it. And when you sync it, it takes a good, so I, so right now it's asking me to, sorry, that's totally glaring. It's asking me to scan the sensor. So all I'm going to do is put the top of my phone right there. And it just gave me the little check mark. And it says activation successful. So I'm going to see if my device will sync to this app and then I'll continue to try it out. Now, when you first sync it and you first put the device on your arm, it takes about an hour for you to get reliable blood sugar numbers because it takes some time for the sensor to get comfortable in your arm, I guess. And it's kind of like taking some time. It's probably um, the extracellular fluid in my arm, which remember, it's not blood. It's like, you know, plasma and stuff that's not quite in my blood. It takes that much time for the plasma to kind of ooze into the needle because there's no suction. The needle's not sucking in my blood. So it takes about an hour for me to be able to get an accurate number on here. Like if I were to right now try and ask it what my blood sugar is, it won't, it'll say that it's still doing its calibration. Um, now the other thing too is there's different types of sensors where it's either automatically syncing to your phone. And at any point in time, I can pick up my phone and you can look and it will tell you what your sugar is. Or what you have to do is you have to, you have to bump it where you go in and you say, okay. Um, and you have to just put them together and it, and then what it does mm -hmm. is this sends all of the data since the last bump to your phone. And so if I pick up my phone and it's been six hours since I last bumped it, then I won't have any data in the last six hours. But as soon as I bump it, it'll send the data. And then within a minute, you know, within 10 seconds, it updates on the app. And then I can see all of my numbers. Um, so the two main companies that make these, one of them is called Freestyle and one of them is called Dex Dextron. And those are the two sensors that exist. All of the companies that I just showed you and all of the companies online are using either Freestyle or Dextrom. So it doesn't really matter what, what sensor you buy. Both Freestyle and Dextron are, are the same. They're the same sensors. They're just made by two different companies. And then all of the companies that are now making tracking apps are using one of those sensors. So it doesn't really matter what sensor you use. What matters is what company you want to use to track your food. Now, NutriSense to me is the most expensive, but it comes with a nutritionist, which is incredibly valuable. And not only that, it comes with a huge number of videos you can watch and training modules. And all of the information I would teach you is in there. Um, I would still recommend that, you know, you bring your, your, bring your phone in at some point with either me or my resident. I have a new resident, Dr. Ventrella. She is here and... I'm looking forward, we're going to do an introduction webinar for you guys later, but she can go through these numbers with you too, where you look at them and you kind of analyze your, basically when you look at the numbers, you want to analyze your prior meals. Um, one question, Shannon, do all the apps store historical data to look back at your numbers? So NutriSense, yes, for sure. I'm going to actually try and show you my last NutriSense numbers. So let me see if I can 
And I'm assuming I've answered all the questions. If there's any more questions, let me know. And I'm going to share my screen. And then I'm hoping that I can share my phone and get a little techie with you. So I'm assuming you guys can see my screen here. So this was, and I, I'm going to use my mouse, but I don't know if you can see it or not. So I'm just going to kind of trust that you can. And if you can't, then that's fine. You can see here, I dropped way low around 4 a.m. I dropped really low. I dropped down to 40. Now, remember, normal is in the like 70 to 140 range, um, but a fasting in the middle of the night. So this is obviously me sleeping. Now, I lie on my right arm when I sleep. And so I'm sure what happened here is I was lying on the sensor and the sensor detected a really low level, but that's because I was lying on my arm. The red dots are my meals or my snacks. So if I click on that red dot, I can see here that I had breakfast, which involved, and you can go into the meal here and you can see I had a sausage, I had a cauliflower patty, and I had a fried egg. And it evaluates these different sugar scores and they teach you how to interpret these things. So there's a lot of information in here. It tells me that my protein in that meal had about 24 grams. It has my sugar and my fiber in there. My fiber should be in like the 40 grams per day and my protein should be in the 90 grams per day. So if this was just breakfast, this was a pretty good breakfast. So that was that meal. I also had tea. So tea was at 614 AM. And if I click on my tea, you can go in here and you can kind of see how that goes too. Um, let me show you. So then I had that meal. My sugar spiked all the way up. In this case, I made it up to a whopping 94. Now, as you can see, my sugars are pretty good. I'm not in the flirting with diabetes range because if I were flirting with diabetes or pre-diabetes, I would be up here closer to the 140. Um, let me show you another day. So this was an interesting day. Like I knew that this was me lying on it. I'm low when I sleep. And then these are my meals. So this to me was interesting. Like why on earth did I go way, way, way high at 3 p.m.? And I looked at my meal and that 77 was at 12.51. And so then I look at, well, what did I eat prior to 12.51? And I had a snack that was crackers with cashew cheese and a green drink. And you can see here, a lot of my sugar markers are much poorer. And the green drink, now the problem with my green drink is I, it was like a, I got it from a store and I couldn't scan the label. So I don't know actually how much sugar there was in there, but I, I estimated 22 grams of sugar. That's actually a lot of sugar. <laughs> that is a lot of sugar. And obviously that sugar totally spiked my level. And I even went way up here. And then what happened after I went way up there, I made it all the way up to a 145. Now you can do the math to decide if this is a two hours, but the, 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 it will help you with that too. So I spiked way up. And then of course, what happens when your sugar gets way high is your insulin goes, whoa, 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 sugar's too high. We got to get this sugar down. This is dangerous for the brain. Let's go ahead and lower the sugar. It releases insulin, insulin goes in. And if you don't eat again to kind of slow the crash, you can see here I crashed and I went down to a 60. Now, I remember this day because James and I got into a fight actually right around the time that my, my sugar dropped. I was rushing. I was overwhelmed. I was trying to do too many things in the day. I get home and I say to him and I was like, I feel like crap. I don't know. I was overwhelmed. And I all of a sudden had like the wherewithal to realize I was actually shaky. I was shaky. And he goes, well, you're, you got your thing on your arm. Check your blood sugar. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> so I checked my blood sugar and I was like, oh, I'm at a 60. No wonder I feel like crap. So this has been super, super interesting. Um, the other thing I have to say about this app that is super cool is that adding your meal is incredibly easy. You take a photo of your meal 
and it uses AI food recognition to recognize your food. So I literally was, was rushing. I took a photo of my meal. I had half eaten. You can see I'd half eaten my bagel and egg. I have another egg with a bagel and I have a sausage. I just took a photo of it and it auto populated the food. And then all I had to do was go in and change the quantity because it only saw one egg and I really had two. Um, and so adding your, your um, I'm going to go ahead and go back so I can see you guys because I don't know if you're asking any questions. Um, adding your meals has been, adding your, eels is, adding your meals is incredibly easy with this particular app because you just take a photo of your food. Now there's a number of other apps out there that are actually starting to do food recognition diet diaries and I haven't had a chance to find them. Um, one of them I was just looking into, it's called Paseo is one. There's also one called Meal Snap. I'm not sure if it does food recognition AI. Yes, you can scan your barcodes, and that was absolutely incredible because any any food I ate that had a code, like my sausages, you know, they're these healthy organic sausages, but there was a barcode, so I could scan that, and then you can save your favorite foods, and it, it tracking your food got much easier to do. You, I will say this: that starting this is a little bit of a part-time hobby. It's going to take some time for you to log your food. Don't bother doing it if you can't log your food, that you're not going to learn. You're not going to absorb the, the realizations. You're not going to go, oh my gosh, that's why my blood sugar did such and such from, um, you saw exercise on my phone too. You don't have to add it. And I certainly didn't. If I did add it, it was either an accident or it accidentally sank, did it act that accidentally went in there. So I did not manually add my exercise. Um, but my point is wait to do this until the first week. You have a little bit of space in your schedule because you can go back and add a food prior. You don't have to add it right then and there, which is nice. But taking pictures of your food was great because I could take a picture of the food and then move on. And then later at lunch or something, I could go in and edit the meal. But it, it's incredibly re revelatory. You end up really learning a lot about this. <clears throat> um, any other questions? I'm trying to think if I have any other ahas. It's been a really cool tool. I have a couple of patients that have enjoyed it so much. They literally, like one of my patients, she's been using it for almost nine months. She's diabetic. Um, now she's actually at the beginning of the pre-diabetes range. So she's not diabetic anymore. She's now at the beginning of pre-diabetes and she's lost about 50 pounds. And it's, it's been about a year and a half that we've been working together, but she, she loves it. Um, there are older versions called Libre 2. And ideally you want Libre 3 because it's going to sync better to your phone. Now that level of detail though, you really don't need to know that, especially if I'm prescribing this. Um, I do recommend NutriSense to start to answer your question, Shannon. I recommend it and I realize it's the most expensive, but I recommend it because it is the most return on your investment. You get nutritional counseling support. And if you're not sure you want to do it for more than a month, you know, either commit to a three months where you're paying. Let me share that screen with you one more time. So um, the Thea link, I'm going to copy and paste this Thea link and I'm going to put it inside of the chat. So that's the Thea link to use. Otherwise, this is the one month link for NutriSense. And then the other NutriSense links are here. If you go to NutriSense and you scroll down, way down here, it's going to have the pricing. Oh, you know what? You have to click on get started and then it walks you through the different things. Um, so there's the one month, the three month, and the six month. 
I don't know if you realize anyone wants to do a 12 month. They think that's just too intense. Um, so I'll put that link also in here. But the only link you do, you won't be able to find publicly is the second link I sent, which is the one that says NutriSense one month. And um, again, that one, so the, if you only want to do it for a month, it's 400 bucks. And I realize that's, I think that's a little outrageous. What they're trying to do is encourage you to do the monthly. So, um, you know, maybe you commit to doing and you spend, um, you know, $900 for three months, I think is also, it's a lot. So I think one month is even good. And like I said, there's a lot of other companies out there now. So even though I realize NutriSense is the most expensive, you're also essentially getting the most from it. But I'm not attached to which one you use. I just want you to um, know your options. Is the needle always applied to the back of your arm? As far as I know, yes. It's the most non-invasive place. I wouldn't want it on my legs. It, um, mine lasted for two weeks minus a day. I, I think it was like a day before I was trying to take it off and I was taking a sweatshirt off and um, you can cover them up with a sticker. So NutriSense actually comes with a sticker that goes around the whole thing that goes on top of, and it, it kind of is supposed to be this protective sticker, which was kind of cool and all, but I have to admit towards the end, the sticker was actually hurting, like it was pulling my arm hair. So as far as I know, yeah, the, the back of the arm is the best place to do it. I'm not sure if there's other places to do it. I could, um, let me see, alternative locations for continuous glucose monitor. It looks like arms and chest sites were most preferred with the greatest sensor failures on the back, which kind of makes sense. The back is very muscular and you want to make sure that you're getting. So, yeah, thumb. some people will say they use thighs. So I guess you can use the thigh. Um, so that's a great question. I'd have to do some research before I recommend any other location. Let me make sure I got all of those questions. So scanning food. You can add exercise if you want, but you don't have to. In what ways does using the monitor help with weight loss? Is it just about keeping blood sugar levels steady? Yes, that's really it. It's really about getting instantaneous feedback about the meal you just ate. So you're tracking the time you ate the meals. That's the most important thing is to take a picture of the meal and track the time. Because the glucose monitor is going to tell you the time of your blood sugar. So you're going to have pre-meal numbers and you're going to have two hour post-meal numbers and you're going to want to see how do you respond to every single meal. And people respond differently to different foods too. I've had some people where ice cream did make them spike. So you're essentially getting instantaneous feedback about your numbers. Now I will say, <laughs> even me, I got a little overwhelmed in the beginning. I was like, wow, my sugar's all over way more than I thought. Like I kind of thought I was going to have like a, like an up and down after every meal, but you saw my numbers. I was like up, down, up, down, up, down, not up, down. I, I was all over the place. And um, so you kind of have to look at the small trends and then you also want to look at the big trends. And again, having somebody to help you interpret the numbers, I think is really invaluable. So whether you're bringing those in and you're reviewing those with either me or my resident, or if you're not my patient and you see one of the other doctors at the office talking to them about it, or having a nutritionist work with you. And um, I have got a number of nutritionists actually, depending on the situation, but they are well versed in interpreting glucose monitor numbers. So if you already have a nutritionist or you want to work with a nutritionist in person, like a human, like a in person, not through the app, then um, they also would be able to help you. And again, you could just go the cheap way, do it as a prescription, and then the prescription app, you download the freestyle app. And the app will track your sugar, but then you need to take the number, put it into an Excel spreadsheet and track your meals so that you can track your meals. Otherwise, it's just not going to be that um, informative. So hopefully I've answered all your questions. If you guys have any additional questions, feel free. You know how to get in touch. You can just email the front desk if you're not my patient. If you are my patient, you know how to get in touch with me. So I hope you're all doing well. Have a good...
Friday afternoon and a good weekend. This weather is magical. I am so excited about cooler weather. So have a great one, everyone. I'll see ya. Bye. Mm -hmm.